No, I, I knew from the beginning that IMG was having those plans and they have the money. Uh, uh, so they are one of the biggest sponsors of the IFF with, 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 with a long-term contract. But what I couldn't understand from IMG is that they could not understand that you should first lay a base. So they are now working on the top and the top brings more spectators. Is, is, it is working, you know, but they forget the base. And still now, slowly, uh, grassroots football is developing, women's football is developing, but they should have started the, under, the other way around, uh, where, where you brought a new base by creating more facilities, by creating more academies, by, by building more coaches. Yeah, you have to develop coaches who, who understand the game and really know how to coach. Uh, because we have seen so many coaches where you didn't understand at all how to, to raise kids from, from 6 till 12 and from 12 till 18 and etc. etc. Uh, so that is what, what slowly now uh, people start to understand. Uh, so, so now I think the yeah, IVA understands this uh, and they are working from both sides now. Uh, top down and from down to top. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. Hello, very warm welcome to the VAR show. The show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail. Today, we are going to connect with the VAR Mr. Robert Barnutas, who has been the technical director of India, Australia, for a new among host of other teams where he has held various capacities in a career spanning multiple decades. You know, like if I go on to take, a, take the name of each and every team, maybe that'll take one hour and Mr. Barn will cut the call. So, without wasting much time, I would like, like to first thank Mr. Barn for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I would like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? Well, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, there are the difficulties of the pandemic also in Holland. Uh, but uh, I am with my pension now for five years after India and uh, so I have finally the time to spend with my family. Of course, and uh, so it, it has not been something unusual for you, has it been? Like the pandemic? Uh, it is unusual because it, it restricts you from all the things that you like to do. You can't travel, you can't go out to see friends, you can't go to the cinema. Uh, so, yes, we have to live with these restrictions, but they are necessary. No, but traveling might, you might be bored of traveling, like, you know, throughout your career, moving from here to the... Well, to be honest, I miss it. I have also in India, I have traveled a lot, but, but you know, traveling means that you can find out a lot more about cultures, about meeting new people, uh, new environments. And uh, I, I really liked to be in, in different countries. Of course, like you know, like like you said, like you have been out of the game for almost five years now. What do you miss the most about the game? Well, the the daily routine, uh, because now I have no agenda, I have nearly no calls anymore, uh, and I used to have so many calls every day, and I have to have so many plans, so my agenda was always full. Of course, and you know, like I'll I'll get to your career, and, and you have been involved with teams across multiple countries and I can even say co continents. How different was the footballing cultures that you experienced, you know, like in different countries all around the world? Well, in principle, there are no difference because it's 11 against 11. Uh, but the difference is, of course, the, the, the environment, the, the mentality, the culture. And, and like in India, the restrictions that you have because of religions. You know, like you said, like culture, how much does a, maybe something like religion or culture have an influence in the football that is being played? Well, I, I'll give you one example. I worked two years in the Emirates with, with Al Jazeera and the, the, the boys uh, and, and their religion forced them to pray five times a day. And that means that suddenly during training sessions, they could say, sorry, coach, I have to go to the mosque. Uh, I'm away for, for, for 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, and that's something completely new for for a Western coach. Of course, Anil, like as a coach, of course you have to adapt to what you do. But 
how difficult is it you know like because you have been uh, used to some set of like you said like as a western coach you would be used to some other set of how things go around and this might be completely alien to you how, how difficult or was it easy to, for you to adapt no it's not easy uh, you learn from your mistakes uh, because i am living in a country where open speak is is very useful and 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 is allowed you can speak whatever you want to say you can even blame your your highness uh, that's no problem but that you can't do that in the emirates uh, so you have to take care of the culture you have to take care of their customs and uh, one of my first lessons was that i am rather straightforward but in the emirates they are never straightforward they say yes but they mean no uh, so uh, and and I, even in india it happens you know where where they say yeah, 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 maybe 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 they don't want to 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 tell you immediately no i don't like it so so like how when did you understand that okay this is happening where they are maybe postponing the decision to say it to you so did you face difficulty in that Yes, I'm, I faced a lot of difficulties, but uh, I, I learned uh, from that. So I surrounded myself with Indian coaches and 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 Indian advisors, so they could help me to understand uh, your different cultures, because you also in your you are one country, because you have many different cultures, many different states, yeah. And uh, so Mizoram is not the same as Delhi. Of course, like you, one a very important. point that you mentioned then you know, like as always curious is like when we see coaches on tv especially we generally see the european leagues maybe the premier league you see the coach coming with all his staff like you have yes. an, uh, like maybe a, around 10 staff who come in but like you said like you always like uh, wanted to surround your staff or you wanted to surround people with uh, the local people so as you get a you know like gist of the culture how important is it for you, like coaches coming into maybe this part of the world to maybe not get their set of staffs and maybe have more of the local people well first of all it's important for the local people to develop also it's important that that indian coaches uh, can do it by themselves and and that you no longer are in need of foreign coaches uh, but you need foreign coaches even still in holland we have some german coaches now coming into our premier league because they sometimes bring new ideas new new developments and you can learn from that So there is a, a mixture of coaches necessary sometimes to to develop, uh, but in principle, the Dutch coaches like to be uh, responsible uh, in the Premier League uh, and leading the, the the clubs by Dutch coaches. Uh, so the majority should be uh, uh, local coaches, and working with a foreign coach can help you to develop. Uh, so I can imagine that Savio Madera learned a lot from us, uh, but we were happy with him. because he could help us understand the mentality of of the indian players of course like and i'll get back to your career and you like you started uh, coaching at a very relatively young age did you always plan into getting into coaching yes yes i was nearly 15 16 years old when i knew from myself that i want to start a uh, it's called a sports career uh, where you could go to a sports school and get your your education and your license and after that you specific uh, you you specify yourself in a certain sport and i want to be involved in football uh, and the, the reason of that was that uh, my coach at sparta rotterdam where i was playing when i was 10 12 11 years old uh, was a, his name was piet de visser and piet de visser is still now 85 years old the chief scout of chelsea and he he came from that school and so i asked him about that school and it looks me so challenging to go there uh, but you have to do first the test to be allowed to enter into the school so i have to prepare myself for the test so i went to all kinds of sport like judo athletics uh, gymnastics uh, to develop myself and and i i was lucky to pass that test uh, and then i got a two years education program and uh, unlucky for me i had to go into the army at that time that you were forced to go into the army at them uh, so i stayed two years in the army uh, and then i i started my career as a coach so you like you said like how like you started like you uh, are relatively young so since you did not have much of a playing career how was it easy or was it difficult for you to you know like have this career as a coach of course it was very difficult 
nowadays it would even be impossible to get the same career as I have had. Because now all the coaches are from former careers. Uh, some are just a former, uh, let's say, a professional player. But most of them are international players like Koeman, like Van Nistelrooy, uh, like so many others, you know. Uh, so the coaches who have my education are mainly working now as a youth coach in the youth development programs. Uh, but I, I started my career in the youth development, uh, then as an assistant coach. So I slowly built my career by getting more experience and, and by educating myself. So I went several times to England to, to watch what's going on there. I was with Coventry, I was with Aston Villa, and I learned from those coaching methods uh, and, and, and educate myself in getting a better coach. And uh, so after seven years as a, as a youth coach, I thought now I'm ready to start my career as the head coach of a, of a second division team at that time called FC VVV Venlo. And, and, and so I built my career slowly, step by step, uh, till that I became uh, coach of, of international level and, and finally ended up as technical director. You know, like I'm getting very overwhelmed because you know, like I'm reading the book called Inverting the Pyramid and I've read a few other books about Dutch football. Yes. And basically, you have lived through everything of that, you know, like how the Jörn Cruyff period or even even something like Lobonovsky in maybe USSR. When that happened, you lived through it. Like, uh, did any of those, like, we generally talk about the, like, Jörn Cruyff and the, and the uh, Rinus Mikkel era before him. How much of that did, did it have an influence on you? Yeah, uh, Mr. Michos and, and Johan Cruyff, of course, were the biggest influence in Dutch football. Uh, total football came from Michos. And he could play total football because he had one player called Johan Cruyff. Uh, but he also had Johan Neskens. Uh, and he had Ari Haan. And he had the twins of Van der Kerkhoff. Uh, he had Chola Ling. Uh, so we had top talents like Liverpool has now. Uh, but it is the coach who has to make the right, the be best out of the players, but to make it a team. And Michos uh, came for the first time with attacking wingers, with attacking fullbacks. Uh, and so. He was the, the one who, who gave the, the Dutch football a big lift. Of course, I knew, like, uh, I wanted to ask, like, in your, like, like you spoke about how Rinus Mikkels had a very big influence, maybe in that full generation of talents, you know, of coaches coming and even players. For you personally, which coach or maybe a person was the, who had the biggest influence on you as a career, as a coach? Well, I, I mentioned his name already. That was Pete Fischer. Uh, because the, he was so enthusiastic, he was so e enormous uh, uh, assisting my, my, uh, in my, my choices to get into that career. And uh, he is an example. He was, not a, he was also not a top coach, not a top player. Uh, but he was also coaching various clubs and he was successful because of his enthusiasm and, and, uh, and, and willing to, to get the best out of the players. Uh, so I think he was my example. Of course, Anil, like I'll talk of your uh, uh, time at India, which happened kind of relatively late. I think it was the last job probably in in football. And how did India happen? Uh, I was approached uh, by a Dutch coach called Pim Verbeek. Uh, unlucky, he died two years ago. Uh, he was my coach, uh, national team coach in Australia. So I offered him that job at that time. And we worked two years together, very successful. And he was, I think, asked for the job in India. And they were also searching for a technical director. And so he mentioned my name. And in that, there's where Kushal Dash approached me uh, and invited me to come to, uh, to Delhi. And, and I, I had to do a presentation for Mr. Patel and, and Kushal Dash and some of the board members and, and one of the IMG sponsoring uh, ladies. Uh, and, Anyhow, my, my presentation seems to be good enough because I, I was off to do. Of course, and how is it working in India? How long do we have? We have a lot of time. <laughs> it depends well, on you. Well, again, uh, after Australia, it was one of the biggest differences you can imagine. Uh, Australia, uh, very sport-minded, already very much developed, uh, easy to travel. And then you come to India where the cows are walking on the streets 
and uh, you don't know what happens with with all those cars and uh, so busy uh, that you when you want to travel for one hour it mostly took five hours because of the, the traffic jams uh, and uh, that was my daily routine sometimes because I, I lived in Gurgaon and I have to pass one of those uh, toll gates you know and, and you have to wait and to wait anyhow uh, it was for me a daily experience daily uh, but uh, yeah I can only tell you that I, when I look back I, I enjoyed myself very very much because there was a lot to achieve uh, and and when I look back at least I can tell myself that I have assisted in getting uh, football, let's say, more and more developed. And 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 uh, and my, one of my uh, books was Laxia, uh, which was a guideline for for Indian football from from where should we go and and how can we get there. Uh, and and at least if I look back now, a lot of those things has happened. Of course, like. Like if I had to ask you, like what was the most difficult? What are the difficulties that you faced? You know, like while trying to achieve your goals in India. Mainly money, and money is necessary to create facilities. So we, at that time, for an example, we were starting academies, and and we could not find any suitable facility. So we had to ask many schools, uh, many. Uh, cities to assist us, but it wasn't there. So finally, we ended up the first academy in Mumbai because they were planning to have an artificial field, and uh, we could use that in the future. Uh, but but when we started, we had a field when when there was the, and and it rains often. So when it was raining, we couldn't train. Uh, so we had to, to to handle with a lot of difficulties. Uh, we couldn't find accommodation, so we have to enter into a school. Uh, and we have to rebuild the classrooms, etc., etc. So the budget that that the AFF at that time had available was not, was not far enough to get it, to get it going. Uh, but slowly we could manage and improvise at least that we could start. Of course, Anil, like since you have left, I think football has grown more rapidly, especially with the ISL. It has uh, become a very big thing right now, at least. So has the growth surprised you? No, I I knew from the beginning that IMG was having those plans, and they have the money. Uh, uh, so they are one of the biggest sponsors of the AFF, uh, which is a, is a long-term contract. But what I couldn't understand from IMG is that they could not understand that you should first lay a base. So they are now working on the top, and the top brings more spectators. Is is it is working? You know, but they forget the base, and still now slowly, uh, grassroots football is developing. Late women football is developing, but they should have started the other the other way around, uh, where where you broaden your base by creating more facilities, by creating more academies, by by building more coaches. Uh, you have to develop coaches who who understand the game and really know how to coach, uh, because we have seen so many coaches where who didn't understand at all. How to to raise kids from from six till twelve and from twelve till eighteen and etc. etc. Uh, so that is what what slowly now uh, people starts to understand. Uh, so so now I think we have understands this uh, and they are working from both sides now, uh, top down and from down down to top. Of course, Anil. You know, like I want to ask you, this might be a very very like you know like basic question, but since you have been involved in football for quite a lot and. You came maybe probably to India at a stage where probably you had experienced everything in football, almost everything in terms of what new experience. What are the major problem that you see in the South Asian market in terms of football that is not letting it achieve its goal, whatever they want? Um, I think um, it is the the, the culture uh, where there is a cricket culture and and football. Slowly now, hopefully takes over. Uh, but uh, it, it means that you have no club systems where clubs are more than 100 years old. In, in Holland, we have Ajax, we have final clubs who are already started uh, in, in 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 the 1900s, you know, uh, a, a century ago. Uh, so that that is one of the basics 
differences where, where there is no history. Uh, to get that history, you need to work on not only on football, but you have to create an environment where the kids are safe, where the parents go to enjoy themselves, so that it, it's not only football, but it, it's a family surrounding uh, where you can come and, uh, and, and, and have a drink, uh, where there is a playground for the little kids, uh, where, the, where, you, you, where your son or your daughter starts to play football. And even if you are not a, an elite player, that you can have fun even as a recreational player. Yeah? So there must be competition for all of them. And now there is only competition for elite players. Of course, Anil, like, I wonder, you had also been the technical director, as you mentioned earlier, of Australia. How was it there? How was the working environment for you, the, your experience? Well, the, 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 the main problem was the same as in India, distances. Uh, so when you want to play a youth competition, uh, which we started uh, at the time that I, I was working there, uh, but to create it, uh, we have to find a, 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 the money for, for that. Because to play uh, Sydney, Perth, it takes four hours by plane to get your, your, your youth team there to play football. Uh, and in Holland, you, park, you take your car and the longest distance is four hours drive. Yeah? But, but you can play competition in, in just in Rotterdam because there are so many clubs in Rotterdam area that your kids don't have to travel for four hours. Yeah? So only the elite players, when they are 60, 70, 80 years old, then they start to play in the, in the national youth competition and they play also Groningen and they play Roda and they play Maastricht, etc. You know, But that, that problem was as, uh, also in India, but also in Australia. Uh, distances uh, is the biggest problem. So, you know, you, you come from Holland where, you know, like, maybe football is a religion. I can even go as far as to say that. And you go to Australia and even India in your last two ventures out, where football is not the main game. It is probably second or even third in some aspect. Yes. So how difficult was it you know, like for you to work there because you know like they, everyone will not be pulling or this will not be the priority? Well, it, it was difficult and it is still difficult, uh, but, but slowly you can see now because football, uh, you can play all year around and it is all over the world yeah, where cricket is, is in restricted areas and restricted countries. Football is everywhere. And, 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 and even now in the, in, the, in, the, in the camps where all those uh, immigrants are placed, but when you see the terrible pictures from those camps, you still see kids playing football. Yeah? Uh, so it is in, in the nature of a kid to play football. And, and you just need, don't need, need no, no more than just something that is round. Yeah? It, it doesn't even have to be a ball uh, and you can play. So football will be number one all over the world, always. And, and, and if India wants to go to that level, uh, and that's my, my hope and my dream, that they would qualify for the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, so they need now an example for the kids where you see that your team is playing on top level and the players become top players. Of course, sir, Neil, I wanted to ask you, this is a very common question or maybe a belief that people at least of India where I have spent a lot of time have is that you know like we maybe we lack quality in terms of uh, uh, in terms of talent compared to maybe the Europeans is that true yeah that's that's true time time is is one of the restrictions but but again I see facilities as the main problem uh, because in Holland if you go to a small village you will see at least eight or ten fields I was in Mumbai, I couldn't find one field, you know, uh, let's say a quality field. Uh, and and that, that has to come. And now it, it is growing. Uh, but uh, we have also, for an example, uh, in, in the smaller uh, uh, regions of the city, we have what we call Johan Cruyff courts. These are small courts of art, artificial where kids can go. They can play basketball, they can play just having fun. But there are always two goals to play football and they organize themselves and they play. So st street football is the, the main base of development of your qualities. Uh, it still is in, in Holland, but you can't do it in the street anymore. So we do it now on the craft courts. Uh, as soon as my grandson, who is 10 years old now, come out of school, he's not coming home. He's on the court. 
yeah and 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 sometimes they fight sometimes they 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 do stupid things but mostly they are playing football so you like with i'll just ask you like uh, since you have all you have seen a time where there was no maybe you know like gadgets in everyone's hand and social media and you know like maybe uh, 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 the uh, digital games do you think that uh, football is also competing with that because now this play, uh, maybe children are shifting to maybe playing football in in the screen yeah of course and and i think smart enough clubs have accepted that so now we in holland have also a competition uh, on on e on e internet yeah uh, with the games uh, so they 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 play ajax psv eindhoven but now on television uh, on, in in a game situation so that that's okay uh, we have to accept it uh, because as i said my grandson is going to the craft court but as soon as he's home he starts to sit behind his game uh, and 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 playing games with his friends of course and you know like you spoke of the similarity between india and australia like being it being very huge and maybe probably the logistic is a ma- ma- major stru- struggle for youth teams you know to go around the country what is the major difference between the two uh, places that you have worked like between india and australia um it's not easy to say but let's say the 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 problem in 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 australia and india is the same in 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 australia the the number one is uh, australian football like uh, the way like rugby you know in india it's cricket uh, so to compete with with the number one position takes time uh, but uh, if you create an environment where the kids can can play football uh, which hopefully india is now developing uh, it will be a success uh, and uh, in australia the the advantage was that already uh, australia is already for more than 20 30 40 years busy on developing football india maybe now for 10 or 15 years yeah so australia has already uh, 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 competed on world cup level twice or three times you know and that that is what i said before the main goal is that 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 india is now coming into the top level and you're like uh one of the former isl players you know like it just escapes my mind is uh, his name who formerly played in premier league I, um, is, 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 the name is escaping my mind he said that the diet is also a major struggle for which indian athletes maybe do not perform at the highest stage is that something true yeah that's true that's true that that's why we started those academies so that we could select the kids we started to select them on on, on the age of 11 12 we brought them into the academy when they were 30 and and of course we saw already because then you were asking the player how old are you and he said yeah i'm 13 but he was looking 10 okay? skinny and, and 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 not many muscles uh, so that is a problem uh, but if you recognize the kids now already at grassroots level and that's what is happening in india now you can also uh, help them with nutrition and advise the parents and when the parents have not the money at least by sponsoring them you can help them of course and you like I'll talk of ISL ISL and continue to talk of ISL at least and they have been you know like kind of plucking players from the A league or Australian league of late a lot of players a lot of top players do you think the, there's a shift in power maybe in terms of the leagues at least yes they are but but I thought and I still hope that these two competitions finally comes together uh, and that they are not keep competing each other but that that uh, that it will be finally only one league one top league uh, which is played in india i think also fifa will not allow for the coming years uh, for another maybe two three years but then they should have only one competition because there is no country which is allowed to have two of those competitions No, no. I meant like what in terms of the Australian A League, the yes. uh, the and the Indian ISL, like the ISL clubs are poaching players from Australia. Yeah. So do you think there's a shift in power between the two countries? Uh, you mean that? Uh, yeah. I don't know, but, but the, I I know that the A League in Australia is also struggling, and they are struggling uh, because they they can't 
uh, find the the right competition at the, at the at that level anymore. Uh, so it's it's too, only eight clubs or ten clubs it doesn't help you. You have to have at least one main competition with at least 18 clubs, preferable 16 clubs, and a second division, uh, and you have to organize that. Uh, so oh. to build a, a, a fan base. You need to be stable and not have an, another owner next year and another owner next year. That's not working. You know, like you were there when ISL was there. You know, I wanted to ask you, like, is the ISL model sustainable? I think only when they are finally in combination with the A League coming together, and 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 they should form a top league, uh, which mostly. Uh, uh, based on Indian players and some top players from, from all over the world. That helps. So, like, you know, like, they just passed the rule of where you can have a, a limited amount of foreigners in com- and which is uh, much lower than, I think, three, is three plus one yes. in comparison to before. Do you think that will benefit the Indian players? Yes, for, for sure. The, the, so, they, they got the chance. But you have to raise them first. So, AFF was starting that with academies. And what I learned now is that, and I can mention one example, BFC from Bangalore has a beautiful academy uh, and, and, and a good youth system. And more of those uh, uh, clubs are, are going to, to show interest in developing academies and build a young, a young base, because that also brings your fan base. Uh, and, and you can't play football without spectators. Of course, Anil, like you have been like technical director of clubs also and also of countries. How different was it, you know, like being the in the how different are the two roles? Again, I don't understand your question now. So, like uh, you have been the technical director of various clubs at club yeah. level and also at country level, like in India and Australia. Okay, how yeah, different are the roles? Well, the 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 the, the main difference is, is that. As a club manager, uh, you are mainly busy with, with the daily routine. Uh, you have to take care of what's going on in your East system. You have to take care of the scouting. Uh, you have to take care of what is happening to, with the first team. And as a, as a national team coach, you are mainly with the plans for the future. Uh, you have to create an environment in which uh, the country can uh, develop into a higher level uh, of players, coaches, facilities etc of course and you like uh, i'll move on from the uh, i'll move to your coaching career and you know like as a coach what was your coaching philosophy like how did you like your team to play uh, my main task and my main idea was to create a winning team to create a winning team there are a lot of things that are necessary uh, so that is that means that your scouting sh- should be good that you have to have a good staff, that you have to good facilities. And then uh, uh, it's very important at top level. I always say that the success is based on your selling and buying of players. Uh, that if, you, if you spend a lot of money on the wrong player, and, and in England they can afford it, because if you look at, at, at Arsenal now, where they have the, the Dutch guy, uh, what's his name again? Uh, on, on the bench and not using him anymore, uh, that's, that's something in Holland is impossible. Uh, but selling and buying players is, is the base of bringing success into your team. Of course, and you know, like, this is quite weird, you know, like, some, two years from someone from the Netherlands saying that he, he doesn't like to play maybe beautiful football, but a winning one, you know, like, that's something I heard very, rare, like, different. Yes. In, in a way, in, in, in a way that generally, like, you know, like, uh, the Dutch are generally uh, renowned for playing beautiful football and will prioritize uh, beautiful football even over results. And that was, I think, uh, it, sh- it was shown maybe in the World Cups where they lost also. So, you know, like, uh, in that way, like, uh, I, have seen, I think you're the first person I have met who has, from Netherlands, who prioritizes winning over maybe beautiful football. Yeah, of course. Uh, winning is the most important because if you don't win, you get sacked. Uh, so you have to to take care that you win games, and if possible, uh, let me compare it now to the situation with Kuman uh, at Barcelona. You know, he won his first game. That is important. Not not if he played nice football and 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 attacking football. You know, that's just something which is created by the press. 
but you have to win. And, and winning mostly brings also good football. So Liverpool is winning the Champions League, not because Klopp wants to play nice football, but because you have very nice players. Yeah? And those nice players are, are top quality and they bring you the, the success that you, are, that you need. Of course, Anil, like you have been involved in the game for quite a while now. I think, I think five decades? Uh, I was 50 years full-time in football, yes. Yeah, so maybe almost around five decades. So I wanted to ask you, like, how has football changed? You know, like, like you have seen a lot of them. How has it evolved from when what it was there until now? Uh, mainly, um, uh, because that's a long story, but mainly now the, the, the influence of the media is too big. Uh, so if, if you lose three or four games, that it happens already now in Germany again. They lost two games that, uh, in Germany, the coaches, and they are fired. Uh, because of the media, uh, they, they put so much pressure on, on, on the board that they take that decision. So uh, the, the, the pressure of the media and on the supporters is, is very big. So you see also now that supporters sometimes can influence the position of the coach. Uh, they are going with, with, with white flags or white handkerchiefs and they can start to wave and, and the board starts to get nervous and they sack the coach. Uh, so it's a very, very uncertain profession at the moment. Of course, Anir, like, I wanted to ask you, like, of course, this is very much dependent on the players that you have. But if you were given the choice, which formation did you prefer playing the most? Which was a favorite formation? Uh, to be honest, that is a question uh, that I can answer very simple. It's depending on the qualities of my players. And so I have not one system. And uh, nowadays, uh, you can see that the clubs can play various systems only when the quality of the players are available. And because of uh, the top teams, they have uh, a broader base of, of selection of players. They can play various systems. Yeah, but you should play a system that brings you success. So if you if you have not a top team, but you can play counter attack, why should you play attacking football and pressure if your team is better in counter attack? Then you should play counter attack. Of course, Anil, like uh, staying, and I'll, I'll ask you, like you have been since you have been involved for quite a while, and you have been with so many teams. Where did you enjoy your time the most? Ah. Uh, no, that is so. That is not not in the, uh, the right question. I and I enjoyed my work for 50 years, in all the positions that I had, and and I, I worked in 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 Holland in all the the different areas in the north, in the south, etc. Also in Holland, different mentalities and different cultures. Uh, but uh, I would say that Australia, uh, as a country, uh, and the way w that I live just near the Manly Beach which is a beautiful uh, situation with a nice boulevard, nice beach, beautiful weather. Uh, I went to my work by the, the ferry boat who, who ended up at the opera house. Uh, so that, that, was, that was not work. That was, uh, I was a tourist working there. And which was the most challenging job for you? The most challenging? Um, well, to be honest, that was my start as a full-time coach uh, when I was only 29 years old. So most of my players were older than, than, than I was at that time. Uh, but I brought that team from the bottom of the second division to the Premier League. And, uh, and at the end, they, they organized a farewell party for me. And there were uh, people standing outside the, the, the room to wait for me to, to hand me over or shake hands or hand me over a, a present. And so that was very impressive. And, and when we got promotion, 15,000 people were in the middle of the city uh, playing uh, and making a carnival out of that promotion. Of course, and you're like, uh, I'll ask you, like, I have a few more questions left. And out of that, the first one is, you know, like, which was, like you said, this moment that you liked a lot, like, you know, like so many people standing outside, it was like a carnival when you got them promotion. Which is the best moment that you experienced as a coach or technical director, like with your various team? Which was the best moment that you are very proud of? Um, yeah, you, you asked me different questions, difficult questions now. 
because there are so many moments that that it's nearly impossible to 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 answer that. But um, I can't say that uh, because the, the, I have had promotion with with, with many teams. Uh, I brought four teams from second division to the Premier League. Uh, I won with Feyenoord the UEFA Cup. Uh, I was with the national Dutch team where we qualified for the for the European Championship. Uh, with Australia, we qualified for the World Cup. Uh, so these are all moments you will never forget. Uh, so I can't tell you only one moment that that's in my memory. There are too many. Of course, Anil, like you said, like how you co- like you spoke of your coaching career like and then you move to technical director which one did you enjoy like do you enjoy coaching or do you enjoy being a technical director uh, coaching uh, coaching i enjoyed more because the, the to be on the field and and build a team out of your selection that is that is something which which yeah which is so much challenging yourself uh, and 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 i was uh, rather successful in that I, I, most of the time, I, my success came always in the second year of my contract, uh, because in the first year you need to analyze your team. You, uh, and again, I said you need to buy and sell players to to fit in your team, and and then you are hoping that you have built the right balance. And and if you can bring that balance to your team, uh, you have success. Of course, and you know, like uh, on that note, I'll ask you a final question. And the question is like. You have so much experience, and uh, if you had to give a piece of advice to a young coach who is just starting out their career, what advice would you give that coach? Well, a few, uh, I think. Uh, first of all, education. So you need to educate yourself. Take time to get experience. Don't want to be the the, the head coach immediately. Uh, wait and 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 get involved in 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 building up. Uh, on youth levels, very various youth levels helps you to develop as a coach. Uh, one of your qualities has to be honesty. Uh, you, you must never lie to a player. Tell him that you are not good enough. Tell him that you are on the reserve bank. Don't come with stories. Tell him straightforward what's happening. Um, surround yourself with good quality staff. That is that is very important. Uh, be patient because success never comes directly. It takes time and mainly for yourself, have confidence in yourself, in your qualities. You know, like you said, like, uh, like, 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 take your time and be patient. Like, ideally, or, or like, you know, like, take, like, uh, get the experience. Ideally, like, if you could, like, uh, you know, like, put a number, how long should a person, like, reach, uh, take to reach from youth, maybe to the topmost level of football, like maybe a senior team? Well, that that depends on on. Uh, we spoke about uh, did you have a career as a football player or not? If you had a career as a football player, normally 35, 36, 37 years old, you you quit. Uh, at that time, you have to, to go to coaching courses. So during the coaching courses, which takes two or three or four years to get the highest professional license, the pro license, uh, you should start on those different levels, and then. Uh, if you are uh, having your pro license, start to work two years as an assistant. Uh, one of the coaches who I worked with is Arthur Papas. He was in India as well. He was the, with the Olympic team and the, the, the pile and arrow. He is a, and he was, and I know, uh, he is a very, very good coach. And now he's assistant in, in Japan from uh, uh, Yokohama Mariners, I believe. Uh, with, with the Greek national team coach was the Koplu. He learns a lot from him, and and now he's ready to make the step uh, uh, and to be on his own. That's a good example. Of course, and I wanted to ask, like, what is the main like you said, like you mentioned a very big name, two very big names, like how after being in India and being the head coach, he went to maybe Japan right now, and he's on the assistant manager. Do you think like many? Coaches and managers would not go and be assistant manager because of the ego. Uh, sometimes the ego. Sometimes because of they have a big name as a coach, uh, they get that 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 job. They can uh, they offer that job. Uh, I can you give you a very good example in Holland. That is Frank Rijkaard. 
he, he directly came from the course and directly accepted the job. And he was not successful at all. Van Basten, he became national team coach and he was not successful at all because he had not the base. Uh, and, and if you look at Kuman, he had the base by going to an assistant position with Van Gaal and then on his own by a lower division club and now can be the, the coach of Barcelona. Of course, and you know, like on that note, uh, Mr. Bond, thank you so much for talking to me. And it's almost been almost close to an hour, and I'll not take much of more of your time. And I wish you all the best for your, you know, retired life. Hope you enjoy it, and hope you can talk again soon. Till next time, take care, stay safe. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much, and good luck with your show. Bye bye. Bye.